Welcome to another episode of Art Discourse. Today I'm privileged to have a very special guest, uh, none other than Dr. Yaron Brook. Welcome, Yaron. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, if you don't know Yaron, he's the chairman of the board of directors of the Anar Institute. Uh, but more uh, importantly for this show, Yaron, I think, is one of the biggest proponents of uh, art of proper art in our world. There's, I, don't, I can't think of many other uh, public intellectuals that speak so much in his show, uh, public lectures and panels about art and also giving us practical advice on how we can apply art to our own life. Uh, advice that I also took uh, from him where I go, go and printed my favorite paintings to hang in my house. Um, so I hope we all can learn from you today. Um, so let's just jump right into it because we don't have much time. Uh, so first of all, Yaron, uh, I know it's a difficult question, but what is art? But, but, but please describe it in your words. We don't need uh, too many difficult definitions. What is art? I mean, definitions are important, so it's, it's important to have a definition. But, but art is basically, it's, it's an it's a individual expressing his most, his deepest uh, beliefs about the world, his deepest understanding of the world, a, a deep understanding of belief that he might not even know he has, right? He might not even know he has. Um, in a medium, in, in some kind of medium, and, and the medium can be, obviously it can be in, in color, painting, in, in uh, three-dimensional, three-dimensionality, sculpture, in, uh, in, a whole, in a story, literature, in uh, visual that moves, in music, or cinema. I mean, there's a lot of, and, and, and there might be new art forms we don't even know about yet. Basically, to, to stimulate in the viewer uh, an, an emotional response to those fundamental deeply grounded belief that the artist has. So uh, art is something that stimulates a response. It stimulates an emotional response, not in everybody, but it, 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 in, in most people. Uh, good art certainly does that in, in most people. And it, it is, it is, that emotional response is ultimately driven by those very fundamental ideas uh, and, and views that the artist has manifest in his creation. So most profoundly, you're saying art is about it's about ideas. It's about ideas and also also values, right? There's well, it's dangerous to say ideas because ideas takes it to a to a particular level. Because uh, you know, uh, Ayn Rand talks in the definition of art, which is a selective recreation of reality based on an artist's metaphysical value judgment. Metaphysical value judgments are particular type of ideas. They're particular types of values. And, you know, for example, in, in modern day today, for, you know, art is viewed as, as almost exclusively political. Everything is political. Every piece of art has some political meaning, a political statement. But that's, exact, and that's exactly the opposite of, it's exactly not the case. Real art might have a political statement, but that's not its crux, not its, not its essence. And that's not the value it represents. What it, the value it represents is these very, very basic ideas that we have about the world, a metaphysical value judgment, which is a hard concept to grasp. But these are, these are uh, statements about the very nature of man, the very nature of reality, and our view of that, right? So it's a value. So it's, this is something that I, I, you know, the artist wants. If you have a a malevolent view of the universe if you think life sucks and the universe is going to collapse and all life on earth will end in 10 years because of whatever ai or or or, or a meteoroid or, or climate change or whatever your choice of catastrophe is if that's what you're obsessed about then that will reflect in your art even if you do something that's pro-capitalist and and pro-technology and everything it'll come through in the art if it's good art the, the 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 ultimate theme will be something that that reinforces that metaphysical view that you have about uh, nature and the world and life and whatever you whatever you're attempting to do politically. Let's say defend capitalism. It won't you won't be able to pull it out because capitalism contradicts the very basic this very basic basic assumption. So uh, art 
recreate something in reality. It, 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 it has to, because it's the only way in which people can understand it. It, it, it all needs to be understood. It, it, it can be just in the mind. I'm sure that when uh, Kandinsky is, is, is putting blotches of paint or dots of paint or whatever it is on a canvas, it means something to him. I'm sure it means something, right? It probably just a, an emotional outburst more than anything else. But it's not understandable to anybody else. He's not communicating. Mm -hmm. And art is definitely a form of communication. And, and in, in that it is communicating, it has to be identifiable. And in order to be identifiable, it has to be recreating something that is identified as a human experience. Now, we'll get to music. Music is, it, it's hard to, it, it, we don't really understand completely what it is that music is recreating. Although Ayn Rand had some theories about that, which I think, uh, which I think makes sense. Um, but, but every other art form, it, it just has to be within our experience. And blotches of color, yeah, I've seen blotches of color, but it doesn't mean anything. It, it doesn't have any significance, and it certainly is not reflective of any kind of metaphysical value judgment. It's not reflective of any kind of fundamental basic idea or conclusion that you have come to about reality. But if we have something more simple like uh, still life painting, for example, painting of uh, uh, flowers, uh, what does that mean? Well, I mean, it depends on the, 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 what, is, what is actually being painted, right? So you can, you can uh, put a vase of flowers in a very dark setting. The flowers can be half dead on the way to dying. Um, that would say something. You could make the painting blotchy and blurry and hard to exactly figure out, uh, you know, you, you really an effort it takes to even see that there's flowers there. Or you could make it sharp and crisp and alive and full of light. That would be something else. Um, and I'm not saying one is better art than the other. All of them are art, but they all reflect different metaphysical value judgments uh, about it. You could also just do flowers. Most still lives that I see painted, uh, you know, they mean something, but it's just they're boring. How do you? That's another thing about art. It has to. It has to interest you. It has to want you to look at it. It has to want you to stay looking at it. So it has to be interesting. So there has to be something of interest in it. So to make flowers interesting and to convey something uh, is a challenge. And, uh, and But I think it's, it's doable. Again, the way you portray the flowers uh, and the, the context in which the light, the, draw, the drama, or lack of drama or whatever, that light is a, is a dramatic means is going to determine what ideas are being reflected by uh, the particular painting. I think uh, one interesting thing about painting specifically because I write about painting is some works are so uh, universal like the one behind me for example everybody has a, sp a specific uh, feeling that he feels when he sees that um, and I can show you maybe later there's a very interesting picture of this painting in the, in the museum where it's, it's hanging and there's a group of students and, and you can see how they are looking at that painting. Everyone has his own face that he's pulling, is pointing to yep. this thing, to that thing. Um, so, so this is also about communication um, and it, it touches us, right? When, when we see something like that, it really touches us. How, how do we, we, we explain that? Well, I, I think, I think the, the painting that is universal is going to be a painting of, of a subject that people can relate to. It ha there has to be something there that is reflective of some uh, of the experiences that, that are more universal than other experiences. Um, if he was an astronaut, uh, it, it would be, you know, in, in, and he was looking at some thing in space, and you could create something, I'm sure, just as impactful. But it would be it would be hard for people to relate to because it wasn't something they've experienced. Uh, nature is something we all experience. Man alone in front of nature is something most of us have experienced. We know what that feels like. So it, 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 and I think it, it gives it a certain universality. And then, of course, it's the genius of the artist to make it something interesting, right? Because that also gives it, if it's boring, if it's uninteresting, people are just going to walk by it. They're not going to stop and look. So in this painting, 
the, the contrast between dark and light that gives it drama that gives you that gives it a silhouette almost is something that makes you stop and look there are all kinds of if you will tricks of the trade you know ways in which uh great artists know how to there's at least one pyramid there there's actually you know triangles are very powerful uh you know uh, uh geom geometries in painting there's there's at least two that are, you know and i haven't studied this painting so this is the first time i'm looking at it there's the two right there one obviously very you know with the figure in it so very dark and in the front and a mountain in the background which is reflective of the same shape again it's interesting right there's perspective there's something close there's something far so all of that is no, other so kind i would of add the figure the figure himself we don't see his face is it so yes, we can no, imagine I mean, ourselves there as well yes yes i mean i i was just even without even talking about that a theme or about or, you know just just in terms of the um the way a painting is structured is going to determine whether you stop and gaze at it and whether you don't uh, and and so a lot of it's you know but it, but a lot of it also is cultural so for example if you take a um if you take a uh, leonardo da vinci or, or you take a caravaggio painting of a saint or some religious scene and you stick it somewhere i mean you don't put the sign caravaggio or leonardo da vinci you just put it up on a wall somewhere um today yeah, some people will stop and look at it. I will immediately say that's either a Leonardo or influenced by him. I, I'm not sure I'd identify the actual thing, but influenced by A lot of people stop and look at it, but a lot of people just walk by it. If you'd put it up in the Renaissance, everybody would have stopped and looked at it. Because it was speaking to a theme and in a medium and with symbolism that related to the culture and which is made. What makes it universal and timeless is the fact that if you learn a little bit about the context, you're blown away by it, right? You, you'll stop and watch it. But most people don't. So most people walk by it without thinking twice about it. Whereas in the Renaissance, they would have all stopped and they all admired it and recognized it. And this is the thing, recognized it as a masterpiece because they were already attuned to, you know, religious paintings. And this is different and what makes it different. So, um, so the universality of it is some of it's educational sometimes there are paintings out there that are great paintings that should be universal and, and and people don't respond to them because they don't have the information they need in order to respond to them they did in the past um because maybe it's a historical context or something like that particularly with painting which is more painting is more um there's more of a story in painting than there is in sculpture at least some painting uh, sculpture, there's no story in sculpture. Or very, there are a few sculptures with stories, but most sculptures, you know, the story is irrelevant. With painting, often you need to know what's going on. Now, not here in the in the, the painting uh, you are behind you. You don't need to know anything about the story. Um, a lot of portraits, you don't need to know anything about the story. But uh, when they're multiple figures and they're clearly interacting with one another. Often the story it, it, it has some significance and it adds to your appreciation of an artwork. So, so what do we have? We have um, it needs to art needs to communicate. It needs to be within reality. Um, it also uh, relates to our culture that affects how we react to it. Um, it's it, and it's all because of communication, right? You can't communicate if it's not in reality. You can't communicate if you're not using uh, tools that are culturally understood. So it really is communicate captures a lot of that uh, and it, it, it needs to communicate. Um, but of course, there's a lot of stuff out there that there's a lot of um, art out there that communicates, but it's shallow and, 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 and doesn't have any kind of deep meaning. It's, it's all its communication is so in your face um, that it, there's no, you, you look at it, maybe it inspires you for five minutes. And then every time you look at it afterwards, you're bored. So I call that, most of that is often illustration or just not very good art. Um, and it, it's, it's just, it's, it's gimmicky. It's, um, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't capture you and it doesn't keep your interest over the long run. Uh, one of the things that Ayn Rand talks about in her uh, writings in the Romantic Manifesto um, is the connection between art and epistemology and human cognition. Um, she, she talks about that um, we think in visual terms 
Um, uh, uh, when we, we get something that is concrete and visual to us, um, it can reduce uh, a wide array um, of ab abstractions. For example, uh, if we have, uh, we can imagine in our mind five elephants, but if we were to imagine 100 elephants, it would be impossible. But when we see it in a painting, we can understand how that looks like. Um, so it's impossible to imagine a hundred elephants. I think you can imagine can, it, but you can you imagine a hundred elephants? Sure, through a visual, you create a visual in your mind of lots exactly, of elephants. Exactly through the visual, you you need. And, you and, need to and there's a sense in which it's not a hundred; it's it's many, right? It's it, there's not a hundred; it's many. But it's. Um, I mean, what what I'm really saying is, most of our most important, not most, all of our most important ideas, are are really abstract. It's not about a hundred elephants. It's about love or it's about liberty or it's about, uh, even more importantly, it's about, you know, the, the life is worth living and, and uh, the universe is knowable and, and A is A and, uh, you know, things that are very, very fundamental and yet very, very abstract. And, uh, and what, what, it's very hard to hold that, right? You hold it in your mind as concepts. You hold it in your mind as propositions. And that is that is a lot of work. Your mind is doing a lot of work in holding that. And then in then you have the whole proof or, or, or the whole um, justification of that proposition, justification of that axiom or, or justification of that value. All of that is 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 conceptual. It's 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 it, and what art does is it takes all that and it, it replaces it with a picture. So, uh, you know, the concept of hero, well, you replace that with a story. You replace that, which is, which, which you can, you know, you read about and, and, and you can hold in your mind as, I don't know, uh, 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 Ivanhoe, you know, I, I've got Ivanhoe in my mind, I know, hero, yeah. Um, I, or, or uh, in the same with, um, uh, I don't know the 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 clarity the, the clarity of, of 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 the universe. The universe is is knowable. It's clear. It's identifiable. Yeah, it can hold my mind. Uh, you know, a painting by Vermeer, where, where where everything is is clear and knowable, and and uh, and, uh, and and reflecting back to you. So, uh, what what art does is it it is it creates a condensation uh, a, a concrete for a massive abstraction right the role of the mind in human life that's a massive abstraction but once you read atlas shrugged then it's atlas shrugged okay i get it it's 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 all it's all those characters and Atlas shrugged and what they did i get the role of the mind in 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 human life uh, and uh, if I have to remind myself a particular way in which it manifests itself, I can run through a particular character. Uh, and, and, you know, if I need an image of a determined hero facing amazing odds, I can think of a sculpture of David or something like that. So there's, it, it's, a, it's a quick condensation um, that allows us to hold these abstractions and live with these abstractions without being overwhelmed by them. So it makes, the, makes it real. Makes it, it makes it real. It, it makes it real, but it 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 it, 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 um, it reinforces their uh, it reinforces what they mean to you. Whether they're true or not is not what's important. They reinforce what they mean to you. They reinforce your view of them, and it, it so it reinforces that, and it 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 it, it confirms it for you. Not in the sense of proving them, because it doesn't prove them, right? In that sense, it doesn't make it real, but it 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 confirms it for you because it it condenses kind of whatever proof or whatever conviction you have around it in something concrete that you can actually see. Okay, so let's move to another chapter in the Romantic Manifesto, uh, which deals with the uh, sense yeah. of life. Um, Sense of life is, for me has been. Uh, I'm still trying. I think I'm still trying to figure it out, um, uh, and it plays a big role um, in art. Um, so, so, to my understanding, could be wrong. Um, 
applied to art, what an artist does uh, with his sense of life, um, he has specific things that he cares about more, he has specific values, um, he has a specific uh, style, um, specific uh, ways in which he, um, a specific approach to life, um, you know, he likes to have beautiful things around him or he likes to have ugly things around him. All of that manifests into a canvas or um, a piece of marble. And that is, art is the manifestation of that, of, of his, it's essentially an art is the artist himself. He is showing us the most candid uh, personal image of his own um, conscious. I mean, it's, it's, it's something like that, but it's, look, a sense of life is a, uh, is the almost emotional, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a, a, a particular state of consciousness that you have that, that is underlies everything that you do and underlies, uh, your style, the way you deal with the world and the way uh, you uh, you interact w w with the world out there uh, and the way in a sense you interact with yourself it's the uh, kind of the, the the conclusion of given the values that you've chosen given the metaphysical values that you have it's the kind of personality and character that is a result of that and it's the manifestation of that uh, so it's not something that you consciously work on. It's something that is the consequence of all the things that you might have consciously worked on or not consciously worked on. And, and therefore, it's, it's, it's a consequence of somewhat accident. And to some extent, it is going to be a consequence of accident because a lot of it is a sense of life. A lot of it is a consequence of, of things that we experience and conclusions we come to when we're young. And, and we can change it, but it's not, it's not easy. Um, and then what artist does is... Uh, an artist, in that he is, in that he is um, uh, painting based on his metaphysical value judgments. That is, that what is reflected in the art. Uh, those metaphysical values are, are, are um, molding and shaping his sense of life. So his, the art reflects his sense of life. The art is an expression of the metaphysical value judgments, which op operationalize, in a sense in in uh, in the sense of life and every artwork has a particular sense of life you in the way you respond to an artwork are responding based on your sense of life again based on the conclusions you have come to about the world and about the metaphysical value judgments uh and um yeah that so it's the interaction between your sense of life and the artist's sense of life which which you get what you get is the emotional response that you get is, is it always the case that a, a work of art represents the artist's sense of life, or it could be that it doesn't represent it? I think to some extent or another, it always represents the sense of life. Because I'm thinking like paintings of someone like Adolf Hitler. Um, I know uh, he had uh, very ugly, but you know, realistic, boring, banal paintings doesn't look like a painting by Adolf Hitler, a guy who was, the, you know, was a monster. I'm yeah, but are they, they're not particularly good paintings. I mean, that's the point. You know, anybody can, anybody can, anybody with a little bit of skill can paint something on a canvas. And, but to be meaningful and to, and to, 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 to really be substantive as a painting it has to reflect a, a sense of life so not everything that everybody paints is a reflection of sense of life okay if i if i scribble something on a piece of paper it's not a reflection of my sense of life partially it's a reflection of the fact i can't paint right so uh you know and, and i do think you can say that uh well i don't think you can read anything into bad art I don't think you can read a lot into bad art. Bad, in a sense, is just boring, banal, um, meaningless. It, it, yeah, it, it, it's if somebody goes to art school and they paint because the teacher told them to paint a particular way, you can't read anything into that in terms of their sense of life. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Um, okay, so so now let's talk about the 
inherent selfishness of art. We consume art on our own, almost unless we go to a movies with someone. But when we, we experience a painting, our experience with the painting is entirely our own, also with the movie. Um, and you were talking in one of your panels with uh, Onkar uh, about um, there's a sense of duty that you have to go to a museum and see all the, all the artworks. Yeah. Um, yep. And I, for example, when I go to the museum, I skip all the, I don't like the, uh, the medieval art, for example. So I go right into the type of art that I, I want. But most people, they have to go through it. It's exhausting. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we all, uh, you know, art is to be experienced. It's experienced as a, uh, you know, as a as a personal. It's a personal experience, um, and uh, there's an immense selfish pleasure that one can get uh, from experiencing uh, great art. Uh, and you know, particularly when you're new to art, it it it, it you know, art can be over. It it can be overwhelming because you know people talk about museum fatigue. And, and the primary reason for museum fatigue is that all of this art is impacting you, even if you don't know it's impacting you. It's, 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 it's doing something to your subconscious. It's doing something to your emotional state. And when you're overloaded sensorily, when you've got so much going on, you experience so many things, you get fatigued. It's, it's, it's exhausting. And, and you don't know why exactly, but, but it's because There's you're a lot of walking consciousness... Also is exposed to a lot. There's a lot of work going on in, in, the, in your head to, to deal with all of this. So, uh, so you know, I, I, I tell people, focus on the things that you love, find the things that you love, you know, and, and go straight there. But, right, as, as you mature in your art appreciation or as you know more about art, or as, you know, you, you know more about what you like or, or don't like, it, it makes a lot of sense to try to understand and to expand the things that you like, right? So, for example, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of art that you need context in order to fully appreciate. Um, and so, you know, you might skip a lot of the Renaissance. It's Jesus again and again and again and again. But when you know more about what's going on, when you know more about uh, art history, when you know more about the story that's being depicted, when you know more about the style of the particular painter, then suddenly a lot more becomes interesting to you and a lot more becomes. And then there are all kinds of other reasons you might be interested. So I, I, I drive my friends and my wife crazy because I often go to the medieval sections and, and go look because I, you know, I am actually interested in the way Jesus is depicted in the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in, in the modern world, because I find it historically uh, interesting. And, uh, and in different countries, you see different expressions. So there's a different way in which religious paintings are done in, uh, in the Netherlands and in, in uh, Italy and Spain. They're just not very good painters. And, you know, so it, it, it's interesting to actually go and, and see this stuff and, and uh, whenever you see, you know, often when you see a really good painting from that, particularly from early on in Spain, it's almost always an Italian painter who came to Spain to paint. Oh, really? Because, yeah. Later, they have good, you know, they have Velasquez. And, but, uh, but, but there's a lot of... So trying to understand, you know, like people, most people will walk by, you know, the Da Vinci and go, yeah, okay. Or, or, you know, there's a joke around the Mona Lisa. Why does everybody go see the Mona Lisa? It doesn't. You know, but the Mona Lisa is a, a, a brilliant painting. It, it is a magnificent, you know, and it's a true masterpiece. But I'm not sure just a casual viewer could look at it and see it's a masterpiece. You have to have some background info. So over time, it's worth expand. And plus, when we're young, we often like paintings that we outgrow in, in a sense that uh, they might not be as complex or they might not be as interesting or, or we might develop a... a, a, a finer aesthetic. Uh, so you've got to constantly learn and expand and try to understand. It doesn't mean you want to expose yourself to bad art, but if the experts out there, if the art historians are saying, 
this is a great painter, it's at least worth going to explore why they think. I mean, there's some painters I still don't get why they're considered great painters. Goya and and uh, uh, comes to mind, and uh, there are a few others. But I, I think it's valuable, certainly pre twentieth century, uh, to um, uh, to at least. Uh, experiment with going to museums and doing different things in museums and and looking at different and it, why it, it's it's nice to live in a city that has a museum and you can go there many times so you don't you're not like i'm visiting london i have to see everything in the national gallery tomorrow um so i i, I but it, when i'm in london i have no problem going to the national gallery and just going to see the five paintings that i know i want to see and then sometimes, uh, like a few years ago, and I did a show on this, I actually went and started with the Dark Ages and just did the whole museum. I did every single painting in the museum. And it was fascinating to see the progression of art. Like you got art history and you got this, you know, and I know enough about art history to be able to say what's going on in each period and what, what's happening. So it was fun. It was, it, was, it was a blast to do that. So you can go different times and do different things at the at, at, in different museums and different museums are going to be different some museums i don't know the the, the other museum in london the um tate tate britain tate the tate british uh which is one of my favorite museums but it's i mean it is and it isn't right because one of the problems in the tate is that they have uh, the good artwork they all cram together one on top of the other and it's like you can't appreciate it because there's too much. Your eye is distracted. There's no mental focus. And there's they do it on modern stuff there too. Yeah, but it, you, you can ignore that. That's easy. I, I'm much more concerned about the fact that the good stuff is displayed in ways that is hard to fully appreciate. Uh, so you, you know, different visits, you can focus on different layers and different. You know, there's the stuff way up there in the ceiling, and it's hard to even see. But. Um, but yes, it's one of the museums I try to go to in London um, periodically. And they also have some good uh, uh, visiting exhibits or temporary exhibits. They have a they have an unbelievable um, storage facility somewhere with uh, some amazing paintings that they never oh, yeah, saw. Oh yeah, I remember. Something. I wanted to see a specific Turner and they said it was in storage. Yeah, I remember that. Um, oh yeah, 90, 95% of everything they have is in storage. Yeah, it's crazy. particularly the good stuff because they have they have a bias against the good stuff. It's crazy. Um, so oh, oh, another thing I would suggest myself: uh, listen to lectures. Uh, some uh, YouTube uh, YouTube's of museums they have some really good lectures by their local uh, art historians. For example, I listened to one from the National Gallery in London about John Constable, who mm -hmm. I always found very boring, but when he started to really explain what he was about, his childhood, um, it, it became much more interesting to me. So I also suggest I don't that. like his paintings, but yeah, I still find the paintings boring, but, but yes. But no, it, it, there's a ton of lectures. Art historians are generally good. Um, it, again, if they deal with pre-20th century, they're typically good. They know what they're talking about. It's always interesting. When I was in Rome, I got somebody to give us a tour of the Caravaggios and the different churches in Rome. A private tour and it, and it was phenomenal because you can look at a painting and you kind of get it and uh, and i know Caravaggio pretty well but but actually what are the what are the breakthroughs here what's new what's challenging why did you do this why did you do that interwoven into his whole life which is which was a fascinating life on top of it gives you a whole other dimension and appreciation for the artwork so yeah definitely definitely try to take courses in art history and, and lectures on particular artists, it's definitely worth it. But also no, no rush, if, if, you, if you're still trying to figure out something specifically that you like, I think it's okay uh, not to have a, a rush about it. Yep. Um, so, so I want to talk to you about, a bit about heroes. Um, why do we need heroes and why is it so central to art? Well, because I think heroism is, is something that is definitely something that we need a concretization for because it's something that is often rare in our own lives, particularly on a grand scale. And it's something that is, uh, for the most part, therefore an abstraction. We don't have personal experiences necessarily with it. Um, it's also uh, something that is hard. It's not easy to be a hero. 
it's hard to be a hero. So to the extent that you want to be heroic in your own life, you want to pursue heroism, um, uh, you know, you need to have some kind of inspiration to get you through it because it's hard. So, for example, having integrity and, uh, you know, which I think heroism is a sub-branch of as a virtue, uh, you know, requires effort and requires focus and requires... Uh, and to have a model for that it makes it makes it easier. Uh, it's also the case that... Uh, God, I was going to make a second point that it slipped my mind. So... You know, heroes are people who overcome incredible obstacles in order to attain a particular a particular value, a particular goal. And uh, a lot of us have that. Most people live bland, unheroic lives. Uh, and it, it, most people's conception of the hero is pretty bland and stupid. It's it's a Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, or, or you know, it's it's a basically a physical. It's all about physical effort and it's all about physical courage. Where's the real courage? is a courage of, uh, of values, a courage of integrity, of a courage of sticking to your, your, your chosen values. Um, and uh, so it's, it's hot, and, and therefore we need, we need an image. Another thing about heroes is they're inspirational. It, you know, heroes represent what we would like to be, what we would like to achieve, what we would like to attain. And having that image is incredibly emotionally uh, powerful. It, it it reaffirms us. It it shows us that it's possible. R Rand has that yeah. quote. Yeah, definitely. It, it shows us what is possible, and, it, and and in that sense, it reflects to us what what we are capable of, even if we are never going to be in a situation where that particular form of heroism is required. So let's talk about beauty. I know uh, it's a it's a big subject, uh, but it, for me, it's of paramount importance I try to it's an advice I think I took from you I try to surround myself with beauty wherever I am uh, also with what I'm wearing with my house uh, for example now I made a, an historical move from Android to iPhone I can I can now also do that and and for me it was uh, I'm feeling my iPhone gig <laughs> yeah everybody's taking that um, so I for me I'm still bewildered by that it, it's so aesthetic it's so beautiful and everything uh, for me is just it's it's improving a lot of things for me um so just it's a small thing but it shows what is it about beauty yeah i mean i think beauty is is really really important it's really crucial it's a it's a difficult topic because you know what they say beauty is an eye of the beholder well not really uh, i mean there, there's some there, there, are, there are universal principles around this and i think great designers understand this and know this and if you look even across cultures there's certain things that are just perceived as beautiful but there is there is some extent there's a there's a lot of optionality in beauty there, there are definitely differences in in uh, in how people conceive of what is beautiful uh, you know and, and you can tell it by how they live and 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 what they choose to surround themselves with they I often go to people's homes and, and they think it's beautiful and I, I just think it's horrific. Um, <laughs> Do you part of it is second-handedness. Part of it is trying to be like everybody else or impressing people. There's a lot of reasons why people do what they do. But it's also people do have different perceptions of beauty. Exactly why, where that comes from, I don't know enough about you know what, what the psychological elements to construct beauty are. But there's clearly something about at least for me, about symmetry, about clean lines, um, uh, and and uh, about uh, and about uh, space, spaciousness, uh, that uh, that that I find beautiful. I find particular kinds of uh, furniture beautiful, particular kinds of architecture beautiful. Um, you know, so it's it's and other stuff I can't stand, right? It's like, I, uh, but. Uh, and, and again, it's very contextual in a sense of the culture, right? So what I find beautiful today, if I had been born in the 18th century, I probably would have a very different taste, right? So uh, I hate 18th century um, architecture. I hate 18th century furniture. Um, and I don't understand antiques. I, I don't, I, I love the art and I hate everything around it. Uh, and, um, it, it, you know, and, and I think that, there's something clean 
and about the modern world that is that should be reflected in architecture and in furniture and things like that. Um, but yeah, to the extent that you have control over it, why not make the environment in which you live aesthetically pleasing so that you you, you are inspired or you uh, enjoy the space in which you are living. The space in which you are living has has meaning. It has it's important. It has uh, substance. And if you can enjoy it, uh, because it just it's one more element to helping you enjoy life more broadly and helping you be happy more broadly. So, uh, to the extent that you have uh, opinions about it, to the extent that it's important, it, it, a particular thing is important to you, focus on it. I I couldn't care less what clothes I wear. Uh, indeed, ideally, I wouldn't wear clothes at all. It's it, you know so. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I like to be, you know, it's, uh, my comfort is like orders of magnitude more important to me than how I look. So, uh, so I, I go for comfort. So you have to figure out your particular, your independent particular uh, hierarchy of values and figure out what makes sense for you in terms of, and, and, uh, um, and that's also part of how you relate to a space, right? If you're uncomfortable, it's going to affect you in all kinds of ways so for me wearing a tie is like i can't be completely myself because i feel like somebody is trying to strangle me it's just a question of when they're going to hang me from uh, the nearest tree um <laughs> it, but i get that it's symmetrical you know but in it's in in that sense it's nice so it, it it's you have to figure out what and when and then of course when it comes to even your environment the the, the space you know some people can afford small homes that don't have a lot of space or they can't they can afford whatever furniture they can pick up but use you, you know i've been there i've done that i've lived that life but even then uh, you know the furniture that i we brought home for whatever used uh, uh, store used furniture store was always i mean we look i if you look at the 40 years i've been married and the kind of furniture we've had in every single place you'll see a theme there's definitely a theme to every sofa we've ever had there's a theme to kind of the way we set up our rooms. There are themes that carry through the different periods. Um, but that's me, right? Those are the things that are important to me. I would only add that uh, I think uh, it's a false dichotomy between comfort and beauty. Uh, but I can prove it to you later. Um, so let us talk about uh, the sublime. Um, I, I haven't spoken to you about it, so maybe you don't have uh, anything interesting to say about it. But for me, you know me. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what I thought. So for me, it's a it's a big deal because I like uh, 19th century German paintings. So I go to, for example, I was in uh, Leipzig in uh, Germany last week, and they had a very beautiful art museum there. Um, a lot of paintings about, about similar to this about uh, the greatness of nature, uh, you know, things like that. What do you think about that? About German painting or about... About the sublime as an idea in painting. I mean, I think the sublime is, uh, is a... Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic... Uh, something to express in a painting. Whether nature is the only way you can do it, I'm a little skeptical. Um, I'd have to think about what the sublime means, but I, it doesn't strike me as it requires beautiful nature um when it comes to na na paint paintings of nature i prefer the americans to the germans um they they were taught in germany the american ones. yeah I, they learned their style but then they what they chose in terms of their themes is is grandeur and and um and drama um that i think they think that you know bierstadt and people like that achieve these magnificent magnificent effects uh, but um what is the sublime? I don't know what the sublime is exactly. I mean, it's it's, it's usually about God, the the, the notion that uh, there is something greater than man. In that sense, it's a negative idea, but it also, I think. Yeah, but I don't think it has to be greater than man. It's just that there's that there's a grandeur to the world. That, that there's a grandeur to man and to the world, and uh, and that uh, you know w w we can and have the potential to achieve that kind of grandeur um that it's that it's attainable i think that's a, that's what a rational view of sublime uh, would be 
And I think a lot of paintings, a lot of the great paintings have that. It, 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 you know, the theme has to be something that transcends just a, a particular story or a particular narrative. It has to be something grander and bigger than that. I certainly think, although I don't know how you would prove this or you would show this, that a lot of music is definitely reflective of this. Right. Yeah. Wagner, uh, for example. Sometimes. Yeah. But I think a lot of music. I think uh, a lot of the romantic music achieves that. Um, you know, when, 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 yeah, when right. the Fomaninovs and the Tchaikovsky. There's a sort of sublime. So I don't think it necessitates a god, but it does necessitate kind of the sense of grandeur of, of the world, of, of, of uh, nature and of oneself. So now let's move to more personal uh, issues. Um, I want to ask you, you yourself, you, you're a PhD in finance, you talk about economics, about uh, politics, about, uh, I don't know, what does that have to do with art? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> um, I mean, art is not something that, uh, so I think everybody should be interested in art. So. Uh, I, I don't consider myself having any kind of special anything with regard to art. I, I just have identified that it's something everybody should should take a serious interest in, and I do. I, I think a lot of other people don't or don't identify it or don't <laughs> are not known publicly to have identified it. But I don't think I'm unique in any regard. Um, I, I, I think everybody should have an interest. Doesn't matter what you do, you, as long as we all hold abstract concept. As long as we're all human, really. As long as we're all human, art is a need. Ayn Rand describes it as a need. It's like food. It's food for the soul. It's food for your character. It's food for your mind. So uh, I, I think everybody should be engaged in it and should be uh, interested in it. I talk about art because. I like it and because nobody else seems to. Not so much because I feel like I'm qualified to talk about it because I'm probably not. But it, it's or less qualified than many others. I, I wish more people were talking about it. It, it. There's so much to say and there's so much to do and there's so much to think about it. And there's so much to experience of it. Um, you know, I've taken it seriously for years. So um, I, I've read books. I've listened to courses. I've uh, traveled all over the world, going to art museums, I've taken tours, I've, so I've, I've just experienced a lot of it, so I have a lot of experience. But beyond that, I'm not an artist, I can't paint, I can't sculpt, I can't write music, I have, I'm completely incompetent when it comes to any art form in terms of production. So I'm stuck with liking it and, um, and uh, learning as much as I can about it, and that's what I've done. I've done that for, for when did I start? Probably, you know, 42, 40, 41, 42 years ago. Let's talk about music. Um, I, I know it's also a big deal for you. I myself, I'm, I consider, I don't know much about music. There are some works that I really like. I listen to a lot of music, but I don't know, I don't know much beyond that. Um, so a, a bit about music and also perhaps some tips on how to start listening to classical music. Yes, yeah, so again, I don't know anything about music. I can't read sheet music. I don't know what a chord is. I don't, you know, just the basics. I do not know. Right? I, I know what I like, and I know, I know, I know a reasonable amount about, about the, the history of music because I read some books uh, about the history of music, which I found fascinating. Again, I find it interesting to connect the history of music with history. I think those relationships between the history of art and history, what's going on in the world at the time, is fascinating. So I, I find that all interesting. So I, I, I read about it. Um, I think music is, of all the art forms, the one that can evoke the strongest emotions and, and can evoke them and, and evokes them directly. It, it doesn't require any kind of mental effort. It, it requires uh, some focus, particularly when you're talking about classical music. It requires some focus, but focus exclusively on the music, not on interpreting it, not on understanding it, not on what happened before, not what happens after, but just being in the moment and really, really experiencing it. And I think that's 
what's really, really necessary to have a deep under, deep appreciation of music. Most popular music is not intended, is intended for instant gratification. It's, in t- it's candy. It's, it's sugar-coated candy, and some of it's sugar-coated poison. It's just there to be danced to. It's there to be listened to and tap your foot. And some of it's great, and it, it, but it's there to be experienced in the moment and, and f- most of it to forgotten. There's, there, there are some great pieces of kind of con- what you'd call contemporary music, contemporary to what period, but contemporary to different periods in the 20th century. Um, but once everybody figured out that everybody likes a beat and people are willing to spend a lot of money on being entertained by having a beat, um, then forget about it. You know, all you get is a beat. So modern modern popular music is just a beat. There's there's almost nothing there. Um, there's no complexity. There's no sublime. There's no nothing interesting. You hear a song once, it could be like ten other songs. They all follow the same formula that gets that instant gratification. It's like the fact that if you stick sugar in every piece of food. I mean, a lot of food, people will gravitate towards sugar because sugar is just too... It's a, addictive. It's, it's addictive in a sense. It's not really addictive, but it's addictive in a sense. A- addiction, the, the use of the term addic- of, the, of addiction is blown up. I mean, uh, but yeah, it's, it's too gratifying to let go of. And you lose the real, uh, the real depth and an emotion that music has. I mean, and again, a beat and a popular music can get you to feel good in the moment, but it, it, it doesn't have any lasting effect. It doesn't affect your psychopistemology. It doesn't affect your emotional state. It doesn't affect your sense of life. It, it, it's just, it just is. Um, classical music has a real, can have a really uh, profound impact on you, and it can really evoke powerful emotions in you uh it it can it can also um teach you a lot about your own sense of life and 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 about your own what you like and what you don't your own values uh classical music also requires work because it requires focus and focus is something that in modern society um attention span another reason why music is so appealing popular music is because it doesn't require attention and we have We've been, uh, again, trained to have very, very, very short attention spans. You can blame iPhones if you want, but television, uh, lots of things uh, uh, cause us to have very, very short attention spans. And everything has to be visual. If it's not visual, we lose interest. And music videos were big uh, uh, once upon a time um, because it was you can focus on the music alone. You had to actually see something. So classical music has to have, uh, you know, has the potential for this. But it does require real effort, and it requires real focus, and it requires real attention. It requires being in the moment without letting your mind drift and just experiencing something, not for one or two or three minutes, but for 20 minutes to, or for an hour. Um, and, 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 and letting that experience overwhelm you. And that's how you get to the sublime. You get to the sublime by, by really immersing yourself in it. it, it, it you know, uh, I... I I hate when classical music is used as background music because it's not something to be experienced in the background. That's that's contemporary music. Even jazz, I think, could be used for that. But classical music needs to be really... You need to devote time and you need to devote effort to it. But the rewards are stunning when you do that. And then, and then again, with music, uh, the more you listen to, the more you learn, the more you can listen to, uh, the more you can, you, you, you know... You can start out by finding, I don't know, um, Wagner very, very difficult to listen to, but you can train yourself, and by listening to other composers, ultimately, it makes Wagner easier. Um, you can find, you can start out by listening to Bach and thinking, Blech, what's, there's nothing there, but as you learn more about music, you find that you can appreciate Bach. I don't think he'll ever rise to the level of Beethoven, but you can appreciate him. Uh, the same with the same with a lot of the great composers again uh if you read a history of um if you read an history of of music 
the people who are identified as great composers are probably great composers. There's probably something there that makes them great composers aesthetically. So whether you want to figure it out or not is up to you, but it's, it's, there's, there's value in figuring it out why they're considered great. It expands your, your, your breadth in terms of the music, even if you never fully enjoy them. Um, the only period in which I think the historians of music are too dismissive, and this is true of painting and sculpture as well, is the 19th century where there were so many great composers, so many great painters, so many great sculptors, that it's easy just to focus on a few names and dismiss everybody else, even though the second, third tier sculptors and painters were better than first tier sculptors and painters and maybe any other era. So the 19th century, just there's so much. There's so much literature, there's so much painting, there's so much music, there's so much art generally. It's just this explosion of great art and actually there's a great lecture there about connecting that to capitalism and the enlightenment and the, maybe i'll do that one day it's oh, a good idea um oh, i have a suggestion by the way if somebody is interested to expand his uh music uh, uh playlist what i do for example is a uh, for example i like rachmaninoff second piano concerto I go to ChatGPT and I tell him, I love uh, Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto. Recommend me uh, other works that uh, could be similar to that. And it gives you a whole list of great uh, works. So It's not it's hard fun. in classical music because there's so much. There is so well, it's much. It's difficult to pick from so, for so much. It makes it. Not difficult. anyway. You know, there's so much. It's, it's, but yes, I mean, if you can use ChatGPT, that's great. Um, but there really is. I mean, I, I'm still discovering pieces I don't know that are beautiful. And um, yeah, there's, there's just... And, and the other thing about music, but like painting and sculpture, is the really good stuff you can listen to again and again and again and again. And again. It, doesn't get, it never gets boring. Yeah. It never gets boring. Whereas most pop songs, even the best, like I can listen to Pink Floyd. I love Pink Floyd. Okay, I can listen to an album once, and then I probably have to wait three years before I listen to it again. <laughs> like, it's not something that I, I, I want to listen to once a month. But you put on Beethoven, and I'm into it, it no matter when, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't change that fact. So, and if you get to the really mediocre popular music, once is too much. So, so let's end with your favorite paintings. Uh, one of your favorite paintings and one of your I have a lot of favorite paintings. I don't have strong favorites. I have a lot of favorite paintings. I mean, I mean, the painting right back there, the the astronomer by Vermeer is one of my favorites, and uh, as is the even more, f and I like even better is the geographer, which uh, is harder to find. Um, I mean, this is one of my favorite paintings among many. I was looking for a, a Frederick Layton. This is Frederick Layton. It's a painter's honeymoon. Um, it's just, I, I, I think it's a, it, the whole organization of the painting is to focus you on a triangle. Again, there's always triangles in great paintings, right? Um, and that is the, 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 their heads, their faces, um, linked together, drawing you down to their hands linked together, drawing you to his hand painting. I mean, he is. He is a painter, but she is completely in on, on this career choice, right? She's not, she's not fighting him over his choice to be a painter. She's completely committed. It's, it's clearly reflective of, 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 of you know, of uh, a, a, a real bond between them, of real love. Um, her expression is an expression of interest. His expression is of a certain intensity that comes from uh, being a painter. The scene is a beautiful scene. It's beautifully painted. It's sharp. It's in focus. Uh, but, it, but you know, that doesn't mean it's flat in the sense that your eye will go anywhere. Your eye goes where the painter wants you to go. It goes to, to her face looking at the drawing. If you look at where, the, where does the light shine? The light shines on her face, on the hands together, and on, um, and on uh, his uh, hand uh, drawing. That, that, and that, again, is a triangle there. Uh, the garment, if you look at her dress and the light and the folds in the dress, are all moving your eye upwards towards her face and her hair. It's, it's, driving, it's driving the eye, eye up. So a, a good painting always has 
the artist has always thought about where your eye is going to go and where he wants your eye to go and what are the details he wants you to capture. Whether you're capturing it consciously or subconsciously, most people just look at this painting, they're not seeing anything, you know, beyond, wow, I mean, look at that, that that's beautiful. But you've also got a place, right? You've got a sense of a place. There's a not an emphasis on three-dimensionality, but there is three-dimensionality here, uh you've got you've got a sense of a rich kind of background of a you know a beautiful location wherever this is happening uh that tree in the background with with fruits and that that golden uh um, wall in the back but the real emphasis is on them is on the couple and and uh, what painting means to them there's a real warmth here with the color palette it's really really warm yes yes it's very it's it's a very uh, what do you call it? Um, there's a term, but it, it, the color palette is all the same. It's all brown, right? I mean, everything here is a shade of brown. Monochromatic. And, uh, what's that? Monochromatic. You want to say? Monochromatic. Thank you. It's very monochromatic, and the whole painting is monochromatic. There's there's gold, but even the gold is shaded towards brown. Even the the fruit is shaded towards a brownish color, so it's it's very monochromatic, and it's very difficult to pull off a good painting with monochromatic because it it often becomes boring, it's often uninteresting. But I think that the theme here and the use of light here is very powerful. You, you'll notice the light is all coming in from the top left hand corner, and 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 going down. No, from the top right. Sorry. Top right, they're right. Yeah, I think that like there's a window. My left and right as well. <laughs> yes. Now for the sculpture. Yeah, I mean this is a good one uh, on the issue of heroism. Um, this is at the Louvre. Uh, this is a, a sculpture of Spartacus, but nobody has to tell you it's Spartacus. You, you know, this is somebody who's just broken the chains, right? If you if you look at his uh, right arm, he's holding a sword. But on his wrist is is the remnant of a chain. Um, on, in his left hand, he is actually holding what is left of the chain. So he's already freed himself. He's got the sword. He's fighting back. He's got this amazing pose of confidence and uh, and uh, determination and readiness for action, uh, which I like a lot in painting. I, I mean, uh, yes, yeah, so I think if you think heroism. Here's heroism. Here's a, here's a man who's sla enslaved and rebelled against it and stood up to his enslavers and, and uh, ultimately gets killed. But who, you know, but that's in the distant future, so who cares? And it's not in the sculpture, right? The outcome is not in the sculpture. I like the... I, I'm thinking of the, the guy he's looking at is he, going to kick his ass. Like, he's going to... Yeah. Conclude. Yeah, and there's a lot, there's a little bit of similarity here to Michelangelo's David uh, in, in terms of the, the look and the, the angle of the head. Um, there's, there's actually another copy of this that I just recently f discovered is in another museum, I think in France. It's breathtaking. For me, it's, I've, I still haven't gotten into sculpture. So it's always interesting to see new examples. I wasn't aware of this one. Yeah, and, and, and the thing about sculpture is, I think Leonard once said, sculpture should always be nudes. You should, you should, don't put clothes on sculpture. Um, because it's essentialized. It's, it's very, very essentialized. Uh, you can, there's only so much you can convey in sculpture. So it's all very condensed into a figure. Okay, so... We have, uh, I think we have come to our conclusion. Um, what is our call to action to the viewers besides uh, becoming a Ron Brook Show member? Go experience art. Go, go out there and visit museums, put on uh, stream, uh, put on your stream some classical music, but don't do it while riding a bus and while running around. Uh, I've often recommended, you know, turn off the lights, lie down on the floor, Blast the music to 11 and, uh, and put on Beethoven's fourth piano concerto and, uh, and let it take over. Yaron Brook, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. This was fun. Thanks, Jonathan.